two years ago that our boys from Jefferson left for training. Although we hated to see them leave, we were a little proud that ours was one of the first National Guard companies to be called up. There were 103 of our boys in the outfit, so it was quite a chunk out of our small population. We had a little parade for them, and the mothers cried a bit. But we all thought nothing had happened to them. This was an hour war. The chaps wouldn't dare attack us. Hitler couldn't cross the Atlantic. The boys went to camp and drilled and trained with their old equipment and wrote cheerful letters home about how they could whip anybody when they got their guns. But after a few months, they were a little better trained than the rest of the companies. So they were loaded onto transports and sent out to the Philippine Islands, 5,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean. They arrived safely and soon settled down to life in the tropics. Then came the stab in the back. took the news, I suppose, like most people in other towns all over America. We may have been excited at first, but then we became a little more silent and a little more grim because we knew the face of every boy. We watched them grow up. There wasn't a single family in town that wasn't kin to one of the boys in Company A. After the first shock was over, we settled down to life more or less as usual. Mrs. Delaney wrote her John to watch out for malaria because he'd had a touch of it when he was nine. Mrs. Ross baked a cake to send to Milton, but he never got it. And we all went to church more often. We knew some of our boys would die. We didn't know which ones, of course, but everybody tried not to think about it. But the fighting went on just the same. <laughs> Last winter came the first telegram from the War Department. Alton took it off the wires just before closing time. It was for Mr. and Mrs. Todd, who lived on a farm just outside town. Alton didn't want her to deliver it by himself, so he stopped by and got the minister to go with him. Everybody was asleep as they drove up to the Todd's little home. Mr. Todd is over 60, and the missus is not much younger. With their son, they farmed about 50 rich acres of wheat, and Richard had gone two nights a week to the armory. Alton said they looked very lonely as they came out from the porch that night to get the news. The minister read the telegram aloud. Your son, Richard Todd, killed in action. For a day or so, everybody resolved to buy more bonds and to work harder. But the Todds lived on the edge of town, and we didn't see them very often, so we lapsed back into our old ways a bit. We laid off at the factory for a day, wasted our tires, skipped a week on our bonds, we felt like most other towns, the war was a long way off. But the war was to come even closer to us. Manila was evacuated and bombed. Everybody stuck by their radios. We were thinking about our boys. So Christmas came and went, and everybody tried to have a good time thinking about the next Christmas when the boys would be back. 
Their letters all said, don't worry, Mom, or we're doing all right in this scrimmage. And we had our heroes to celebrate, too. We learned that Steve Johnson, one of our young lawyers, had led the boys in an attack that netted 60 Japs. Everybody congratulated Mrs. Johnson, and it was really something to talk about for a few days. But then the retreats began. We knew that things must be getting worse because their letters were getting more cheerful. The boys were trying to keep our spirits up. There were more telegrams. There was one for old man Landry about his grandson Jamie, who had been an orphan. One for the Whites and the Greenbergs and two for the Dunlaps. The two Dunlap boys had always stuck together. The war was certainly getting closer to us now. We were in the middle of America. We couldn't be bombed. But there was a war right here on our front step. And it came right in the door on the day that Batan fell. We knew that most of the boys had escaped to Corregidor, but all other news was scarce. Somebody started a cruel rumor that they'd all been killed. Though we tried to stop it, people picked up scraps of gossip and passed them on as gospel truth. Poor Mrs. Stone was told three times that her boy was dead. But it wasn't true, so now she just doesn't believe any rumors, only what is official from the government. Somebody, instead of hanging out black crepe, put a flag out on the front of their house. And soon they were all over town. We were worried and proud at the same time. But now the fighting was fiercer and more deadly. It was a terrible blow to Dr. Harper that his boy died on the operating table. Killed by a bomb from a Jap plane. Often we got a little desperate in our thinking. How could we give them the things they needed? We wished we could take the comforts we were enjoying in our homes and carry them out to the tropics and give them to our soldiers, as we did when they were kids at the Boy Scout camp down on the river. The war was here now, right here with us, in every home in town. This was what we had to fear and what we had to fight. But we could only work a little harder and give and hope and pray. It couldn't get much worse, but it did get worse. On the 6th of May, in a hell of heat and fever and fighting, Corregidor Fortress surrendered. All the rest of our boys, 92 of them, were swallowed up in one day. They were prisoners of war at the treacherous mercy of the Japs. They were missing in action. We didn't know how many of them were dead. All that night, our people wandered around the streets, from the post office to the courier, down to the depot to get the papers off the train, trying to get some news, trying to get or give some comfort. But very little was to be had. This was war. War brought right here to our little town, forced upon us by an aggressor whom we had helped and tried to trust in the past. Naturally, we couldn't do much of anything for a few days. We couldn't work. We couldn't even sleep. Our two remaining doctors had their hands full treating people for shock and for old sicknesses brought back to life by worry and grief. But everybody took it bravely. Mrs. Deering said my boy would be fighting now if he'd had guns and food for his men. The Todds, who would have to farm alone now, said it makes us realize how little we've done to help them. We all wondered at one time or another how the rest of America felt. Those who had not lost sons and brothers and fathers, but just a battle. Some of us were disillusioned, 
And some of us were just plain mad. We tried to make some plans. A committee phoned the Red Cross in New York to see if there was any way to get letters to prisoners of war under the Japanese. And the rumor mongers tried to start up again, telling harrowing tales of Japanese atrocities to prisoners. But they didn't get very far. Our minds weren't idle now, so we didn't have time for rumors. We knew the enemy and what he was like. And then things started to happen. Our salvage drives took on new meaning to us because our boys could have used the things we'd been wasting. We didn't keep for ourselves anything that could help our soldiers. And we realized in a way how lucky we were. We were a little ahead of the rest of America. We had learned the full meaning of this war because we had lived with its pain. There was no doubt in our minds now, no complacency, no indecision, no time to think of our own troubles, just time to fight, to work overtime. A lot of the kids went out to the farms to help harvest the crops. Hands were important now, more important than experience. Our high school teacher, a filling station man, and Bill Daniels organized a fix-it committee. They were all handy with tools, so they worked after hours on refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, automobiles. In that way, an aeroplane factory got two more mechanics they needed to make the planes we didn't have at Batan. A shipyard got a welder who helped launch a ship three days ahead of schedule. And there was one more man in America making guns. We all either walked or stayed home and gave up our tires so that our army could roll and our planes could land. We didn't realize how many things we could do that we hadn't done before. We made over our clothes so our soldiers could keep warm. We didn't waste electricity. And the smelters a hundred miles away had more power to make steel. We sent the Navy six pairs of good binoculars. And an Axis Raider was sunk in the Atlantic. And we didn't spend our money either. We put it to work to get our boys back home. We weren't going to face them again after all they'd been through without being able to say with a clear conscience, we did everything we could to help you. Not a little bit or more than we thought we had to, but everything, all day in every way we could. And in spite of the gnawing grief that was always inside us, we began to feel a little elated. There was joy in our work because we knew we could face our boys. To those who had given arms and legs and eyes, we could say that we gave not only our sickening luxuries and comforts, but our money, our thought, our skills, our work, and our sweat. It was a different town that watched our second troop march off to war. There were almost 200 of them this time. Some of them weren't as husky as others, but they could help their pals. Yes, we were a different people. We knew that through our efforts, these boys would have guns this time, better guns than the enemy. They'd have food to sustain them, medicine to keep them well. They'd have fast planes, tough tanks, and fleets of ships to keep them supplied. They'd be better than any enemy. Their weapons would be stronger because all the ingenuity and mechanical skill of our whole great nation would be behind them. These boys would never have to surrender because we at home would never let them down. We knew that all America would learn what we had learned the hard way, that this is everybody's war. Not war for an outpost here or a naval base there, but war for every foot of American soil, every home and field, for all our friends, for all our kin. A war without compromise and without quarter. A war that must end only one way, in freedom for the world and for our little town. Woo! What a great film. Uh, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to our lunchtime streaming event that we've been doing for nine and a half weeks. And um, that last film, It's Everybody's War, uh, made by 20th Century Fox, um, featuring Henry Fonda as the voiceover, and then, of course, some other uh, uh, character actors 
showing up in different scenes. Um, I have quite a few films that actually are uh, films about buying war bonds, um, usually uh, designed to uh, inspire guilt uh, or patriotism. There's a Memo to Joe, there's Who Died, um, yeah, quite a few. I, I, I might have some of those actually uh, digitized. We might show some more of those, but it's, it's great. It's about the home front um, during World War II. And, um, it, you know, what can you do to help your boys who are at, at war and who are sacrificing their lives? How can you make it worth, worth it for them? And that's an interesting thing that has changed over the years as far as our wars. Like, what can we do to help our young boys? Um, that doesn't seem to be as uh, prevalent. Um, and to unify against a common enemy. That would be another great thing to kind of see happening. Anyhow, um, yeah, we've been uh, collecting old educational films for about 25 years and showing them to folks like you. And so thank you for joining us. I, my hair is getting longer and longer and longer, like all of us. Um, and I might just have to bust out the clippers and go uh, uh, buzz cut. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. It's actually still kind of cold, so it's my head would actually get cold and I have to wear a hat. Um, but we'll see in June. Uh, this next film is animated, and it's called Machine Story, and it looks at uh, machines, and it has a slight anti-war message to it. So here's Machine Story.
it kind of sped up at the end. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, there is a machine story. Big fan. Um, I know a lot of you have been looking for activities to do at home. Um, and getting sick of watching the screen. So here's something that you can do with uh, things that you have in your kitchen. This is starch painting. How to make a starch painting. students, kindergarten through college, can enjoy. Spencer enjoys swinging to create his starch painting while listening to music. It's so free and easy and can be done quickly. You need few materials to explore and create in many ways. Use starch painting for Christmas cards, invitations, menu cards, and wrapping paper. Notice how a starch painting made an interesting placemat. Natalie covered a box top with her starch painting to make a tray for crayons. Or paint a picture about what you're studying. It's easy to starch paint. Would you like to try? Here are four steps to remember. First, cut a piece of cardboard to design with. Cut several for different ideas. Second, cover any glazed paper completely with prepared or boiled starch mixed to the consistency of cream. Third, add tempera, easel, or watercolor paint to the starch. Fourth, experiment. Design the surface with cut cardboard. Materials you need are glazed paper, board, newspaper, paper towel, starch and brush, tempera water paints, paintbrush, wet towel to keep hands clean, cardboard and dry towel to keep desk clean. This is Terry, ready to paint a design with starch. She uses paper cut from a roll of butcher paper. Use any glazed paper. It prevents starch from soaking in. Two tablespoons of starch will cover a sheet of paper 16 by 22 inches. A flat brush will help to spread it. Terry adds a teaspoon of tempera paint to her starch paper. She doesn't have a board to work on, so she uses newspapers. They are larger than her starch paper, so she can keep her table clean. She covers her paper with one color before beginning her design. Use a brush to put paint on smoothly and quickly. Stand while painting. It's easier to swing your design on paper and helps keep your clothes clean, too. Terry has experimented with cut cardboard so she knows the designs it will make. After the painting is finished, lay it on clean newspapers to dry so the edges will not stick to them. If edges curl like this after drying, turn it over and press with a warm iron. Or use books as weights and leave overnight. 
Now Terry is ready for a craft project. See how flat the edges are after pressing. This is the design she will use to cover a box. Terry cut the starch painting to fit her box before pasting it. Mix paste with water to consistency of cream for all over pasting. Use a wide brush. Now watch how carefully she wraps pasted paper around the box. Terry planned and knew how to use materials so her box does not have wrinkles. Be sure to cut the paper larger than the box top so it will be big enough to cover sides and edges. Paste paper all over. Place box top on paper. Bring the paper over sides of the top like this. Add an extra strip around the side to make it neat and strong. Press firmly to help it stick. You do not need to cover the bottom. Now, how do you think Terry will use her box? Why, look, it made a nice knitting box. Rope or yarn can be added for handles. Can you think of other ways to use these boxes? Experiment in many ways to design with starch. Move cardboard across the paper for straight lines. Watch how to get zigzag lines. Now, half circles. In this way, lines of radiation. Or use it for writing. Now watch other ways. Paint one color over the starch paper. Drop a contrasting color on it and see what happens. Try sprinkling many dry powder paints on starch paper. See what interesting colors can be made. Experiment more. Try folding the corners over the paper like this. Press down, and now open the paper. Try this with all corners. It's fun to mix colors right on paper to discover new ones. Try painting strips of colors across the starch paper for interesting space feeling. To get texture, bring corners together while still wet and crush between hands. Take the corners and unfold them. Notice what crinkled texture it makes. Can you think of other ways to create texture? Notice these different materials. Explore to discover what kind of texture and design can be made by using them. Paint some of them with a brush like this and place on a clear, wet starch paper to make a design. Or use them this way on a freshly painted starch paper. Or dip them in paint mixed with starch and press on a dry, unstarched paper. Here a wad of paper is being used. Notice how the painted end of a spool made this all-over design or paint the side of a worn eraser to get other shapes. The natural grain of wood when painted makes interesting texture. Dip the kitchen scrub brush in paint and see what a nice texture effect it gives. Or the interesting holes of a sponge. Paint the ends of a piece of folded tag board and see what happens. You do not need paint when using colored chalk. Just rub it into the wet starch paper. This beaded design was made from the painted end of a curved piece of corrugated paper. Take a tongue depressor and see what interesting line design you can create. Paint edges of box ends and overlap them to get many other shapes. Miriam, a second grader, will paint a picture. She uses a large flat brush and covers the glazed shelf paper with starch. Using a smaller brush, she dips into her easel paint and begins to paint. Now for a few sweeping lines. Miriam uses a board under the wet starch paper because it's easier to work on. She knows it's best not to have her paper too large and to work fast because the starch may dry out. What do you think this will be? An animal? Why, look, it turned out to be a running horse. 
All the second horse needs are some prancing legs. Place wet brushes on paper towel when not in use. Miriam put these horses in the desert. Watch the cactus plants grow. After she adds the ground, she uses her cardboard for fine textured lines. Powder poster paint can be sprinkled right on the starch paper. Here, Miriam adds blue for sky. A sweep of the brush will make the color stronger. Well, I guess this picture is about finished. Look, Miriam's picture is framed and ready to hang on the wall. Would you like to paint about what you are studying? Use starch painting for booklets, portfolios, photo and address books. Cover ice cream cartons with starch designs for waste baskets. If she'll act, they will be stronger and easier to keep clean. These boxes have been covered with starch designs for jewelry, flowers, stamps, and other uses. Create other starch designs and cover boxes for letters, cooking recipes, arithmetic cards, or file boxes. designs for Christmas and gift boxes. Starch paintings make interesting pictures for home and school. Try many ways to create your starch painting. Drop contrasting colors on starch paper for design. Or paint imaginary trees. It will be fun for you to experiment and find new ways of creating in starch painting. Well, that was exciting. Um, it's unfortunate the color faded to, to red. We tried to, it was beet red before. Uh, and so it's ironic to talk about colors and painting when all the colors look like they're a variation on blood. Um, so, <clears throat> but I love the, uh, the tone of that is just so calm and relaxing. It's very uh, Bob Ross. And I have been watching some Bob Ross recently um, forgetting how much I truly enjoy, uh, the meditative aspect of watching that show, sitting there drinking coffee, having breakfast and watching Bob Ross create the world. Glorious. Um, this next film, the color is vivid in this next film and it's glorious. It's almost like, uh, this is a film uh, on how to be a cashier in a uh, grocery store and it's almost like they're in a primary color uh, grocery store. Um, see if you can figure out why this is brought to us by Reader's Digest. This is the front line. <laughs> People call this a war. War or not, one thing is sure. A daily battle is being waged in supermarkets all over this country. A battle for the customer's dollar.
If a store is to make a profit in the face of today's stiff competition, everyone in it must give his full effort. But like any battle, victory in this conflict is finally won or lost on the front line. With literally millions of dollars at stake, success is measured in pennies. The checker plays a key role in this daily struggle. Methods of handling groceries and customers may vary from store to store, but the basic objectives are the same. Check the customer's purchases accurately, ring them up correctly, and collect the money for the store. And there's more, much more. Probably no job in a supermarket affects the store's success more than that of a checker. Her every action reflects on the store and its entire staff. She is a shopper's last, and often only, personal contact with the store. To the customer, the checker is very important. Her responsibilities are great and varied. But with all of them, one of a checker's primary obligations is to keep the traffic moving. Sometimes a checkout lane begins to resemble a crowded thoroughfare. When jam-ups form, they're hard to get rid of. And the analogy goes much deeper. The colors of traffic control, red, yellow, and green, have a real relationship to the science of good checking. Naturally, the idea is to keep things moving, to keep that green light glowing. Good checking really boils down to the same essentials, no matter what type of equipment your store uses. To demonstrate these essentials, here are three outstanding checkers, all former queens in the Checker of the Year competition. Meet Ruth Bussey of the B&B supermarkets in Tampa, Florida. A checker for 10 years now, Ruth was chosen International Checker of the Year in 1964. Next to Ruth is Pat Hilton of the Alpha Beta Supermarkets in La Habra, California. Pat has 18 years experience and was International Checker of the Year in 1962. And this is Rose Scalabino. Rose has four years experience and works for Star Market in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Rose was Checker of the Year in 1963. And here's another checker you should meet. Miss Jones is not a checker of the year, but she hopes to be someday. She's an intelligent, hardworking, charming young lady. Still a little new to her job, but learning fast. Like most of us, she could learn a lot just by watching experts perform. The first thing I do when I start the day is get my cash from the head checker. In a busy week, $5,000 or more may pass through my register. Handling it accurately is one of my biggest responsibilities. Once I've got my money counted out and correct, I put my register through a daily inspection. Is there enough tape? Is it dated correctly? Is the register plugged in? Is it zeroed? I always check supplies now when there's time to replace needed items. Are there enough bags to last? I don't want to run out later. I always try to remember that I'm dealing with food. That means that my stand has to be spotless. My merchandise racks must also be in good order before the day begins. The last thing I check is the most important, myself. Appearance means a lot on this job. Thorough preparation is a mark of every good checker. When the day begins, Miss Jones is ready. The idea is to keep that green light on, to keep the lane moving. But that's not as easy as it may sound. There are times when caution is necessary. And sometimes... Sometimes you must stop altogether. The important thing is knowing the difference. But 
so long as you observe the basics, things will keep moving smoothly. Watch an expert. The first order of business is to greet the customer. Then comes an important moment of caution. Is the bottom of the cart empty? I always make certain there are no missed items that might get through unchecked and ring this up as a signal to myself that I've checked the cart. And most importantly, I keep it pleasant and matter of fact. No customer likes to think she is suspected of shoplifting. Ring up the right price and press the right department key. These keys are important to the store's records and planning. Checkers are bookkeepers too. Multiple priced items should be checked together. Try to hold the first items in this group until they can all be checked through at once. Multiple pricing used to frighten me. I'm not much on fractions. Now when I see an incomplete group like this, I just slow down a second to be sure I've got the price right. This is what the fraction chart is for, and I use it. There's no such thing as an almost right in this business. If I overcharge, I cheat the customer. If I undercharge, I'm unfair to the store. Fractions mean you charge the next penny. Dropping the fraction can be costly. It might well represent the entire profit on this order. Here's another pricing problem, a price smeared beyond recognition. How do you decipher it? This is one time I stop everything. I don't guess. I ring for my supervisor and set the smeared item aside until she comes. In the meantime, I can continue putting the rest of the order through. Although I study the prices and know the specials, I'm always on the lookout for certain booby traps. Some items, like soups, have different prices for different types. Others have identical package designs, but different prices. For instance, pineapple chunks at 39 cents and crushed pineapple at 33 cents. It sometimes seems like a lot of worry about a few pennies, but think a minute. With a store's profit margin of about one and a quarter percent, a checker error of only 30 cents means that about $25 worth of groceries must be sold before the store regains the loss. It's more than just pennies. It's a question of your store's success or failure. And once the order is checked, there are still some important jobs to be done. Handling money is one of a checker's greatest responsibilities, and sometimes one of the most difficult. Handling money is largely a matter of knowing the rules and following them to the letter. There are many systems, but generally your stores will be similar to this. Defer coupons until the order is paid for. Know your store's policy on check cashing and follow it closely. As you accept the customer's money, call the out of amount, such as 1238 out of 20. Put the check or bill onto the slab and count the change to yourself, then to your customer. And never forget, thank you. Lastly, put the money from the slab into the register and never leave your position with your register open. Coupons are simple if you handle them right. After the customer has paid the regular price for her order, check her coupons against the purchased items. Sometimes people haven't actually bought the goods specified on the coupon. Total the coupons, take the cash, and refund it to the customer, remembering to do so with a smile. This system makes your job easier and lets the customer know her coupons were credited. Trading stamps are simple too. Be accurate and remember they are money. Giving a customer more than she is entitled to costs the store. The final job of a checker is one that most checkers like least, but it's also one of the most important.
I guess I can't say I've ever enjoyed packing an order, but I know how much depends on it. It's one part of the store the customer takes home with her. Beginning with the right size bag, I pack heavy to light. That's also the way I'd send the order through if a bagger were working with me. After a solid base is made up with cans and other heavy items, I build up the sides with flats, putting glass and other fragile items in the center for protection. Meat, frozen foods, and ice cream should always be wrapped separately. Finally, light crushables go on top. Knowing the fundamentals makes the job easier and helps you to do it better. But there's one area of checking where each girl brings something special to her job, where there are no universal guidelines. Personality is something every good checker develops on her own. She learns to communicate a comfortable pleasantness to her customers, making them feel that the store regards them as something special. A smile is always part of the uniform. The job is easier when you do it right, and people are generally nicer to deal with when you treat them right. Checking is never going to be an easy job. The responsibilities are too great. Just consider how much work a good checker does on a busy day, putting through up to 360 orders, checking some 7,000 separate items. You have to be good and develop good habits, such as maintaining space between unchecked items and those that have been checked. These girls are among the best. It takes skill and practice to get this good. And a lot of effort. But the basics are simple. Slow down when the situation calls for extra care. Stop completely on those few occasions that require it. And keep the flow moving the rest of the time, swiftly, accurately, and pleasantly. Remembering the fundamentals may make Miss Jones a checker of the year one day. It might do the same for you. This battle is won on the front line. It's here that the customer has her last important contact with the store. To a large extent, a checker's actions determine whether a shopper will be back. It's a difficult job at times, but learning the skills we've seen demonstrated will help assure that it's done right and will make your task much easier. In your store, you are a vital member of the team. By always observing the fundamentals, you'll be doing your part on the front line. So, uh, why we why do we think uh, Reader's Digest sponsored that? Um, here's my guess: is that Reader's Digest was a impulse buy in the impulse aisle, like right next to the checkout. And if you had a positive checkout experience, um, you could feel positive about getting. I don't know, if, if it's a positive experience, then, oh, well, yes, I'd like to buy this Reader's Digest. Um, I don't know, I'm just pulling that out of the air, not really sure why. <clears throat> but one of the things in watching this, and I watch a lot of these films, um, is I saw the woman with the coupons, and she had that kind of attitude, that kind of, um, I don't know what, how you would describe it, but... It looked, she looked so much like this uh, character actress, um, Fran Ryan, um, who made a, an entire career of being that difficult customer. She was in Stripes, where she was at the beginning. Uh, Bill Murray's character was the cab driver who was taking her to the airport, and she was very difficult to deal with. Uh, over the years on television, she always played the annoying neighbor, um, who was always causing problems for the main um, characters of the sitcom. Um, and just, I, it just seems like it's her character, you know? And like, she, 
So I'd love to think that that's who she is. Uh, sadly, she has passed on. And IMDb is horrible when it comes to attribution of people in these educational and sponsored films. Um, but in my heart, I feel like that's her. All right. Um, what time is it? 1.38. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this next film... I, I love this film. Uh, it is part of a kind of type of film that was made in the 70s and a little bit in the 80s, but really we don't see these now. And this is uh, a film that deals with uh, commercial literacy, um, being very aware of what commercials are doing and saying. And um, I have probably th three or four films that deal with that. Um, and I don't know if they really make those things now. I don't think that um, maybe some of you that have kids, you can ask your kids, like, hey, do you have a section in your, in your studies that talks about commercials and how they use misleading uh, things to uh, get you to buy? Um, I showed Supergoop before, which is um, about serial commercials. It's a really wonderfully damning thing about serial commercials, about how children's cereal is marketed to, to kids. Uh, this is called 30 Second Dream, and it's actually released by a religious film distribution company, but it, it, it kind of gets at the, you know, what is being sold in a 30 minute, 30 second commercial uh, and this is in the 70s, and but it's certainly something to think about now. And this is one of the reasons it's hard for me to watch commercials now, um, because the the manipulation and exploitation is so high for me. It's I, you know, I like the Geico commercials because they're just funny, and they they go so far in another direction. It's not about you know using the traditional advertising to to get the point across. It's just like. 15 second, 30 second, ha ha. So anyway, here's 30 second dream. I hope you guys like it as much as me. Good morning. For you, only the best. Nothing that makes us something It's what we miss that hits the mark It's what's left out that leaves us in It's the light shining over the dark Yes, it's a good day A beauty rest day Yes, it's a good day A beauty rest day When you have the sight Your day is okay So get your beauty rest day On a day like this, bring all the sun in with Windex Good morning, America. Come join us for scrambled eggs and sausage. Good morning, America. Come join us for hot cakes and sausage. You're the one. We've got your hot cakes flying. You. You're the one. We've got your sausage flying. It's a new day coming, but in a world that never existed. People by folks who don't really live there. A six billion dollar dream world. Create it all for you. We do it all for you. Television commercials. Who can resist the promise of a new day? A fresh start. And the product that just might make it happen. on the right side. Wake up with Kellogg's Rice Krispies cereal for breakfast. From early morning to late at night, 
A highly sophisticated advertising industry repeats its message. You're a little inadequate, America, but don't worry. The solution is only a purchase away. And we pay. We pay and we listen. Because, as one European put it, American garbage is the most colorful, beautiful garbage in the world. How do you begin to talk about a swell love? I was in the malt shop when she entered my life. She was so different, fresh, clean. I had to tell her, gee, you're swell. The rest was like a dream. I loved my uncola. Then it happened. It's raisins that make post raisin bran so wonderful. It's raisins that make post raisin bran so different. It's more raisins than you have ever seen before. If you like raisins and juicy raisins, you like post raisin bran more. Romeo. Yeah, sweet Julia. My garbage is ready. Oh. My, how strong these are. What are they? Oh, hefty. I can read. If you're lonely and cold, I'll build you a fire. But beyond all the beauty, we are hooked. Hooked by the promise of being loved. I know you do it for me. If you're thirsty and down, I'll bring you coke and some ice for you and for me. It's a real thing to life. Oh, I do it for you. We would all like to believe in the dream. Family. Intimacy, vitality, success. Four areas of deep emotional concern where many commercials focus their promise. Watch carefully what follows. But most of all, watch yourself participate in the 30-second dream. To have a family, is to have responsibility. I like to let my kids make their own decisions, but I worry about the bills around here. So when I saw them using these sex appeal toothpastes, I told them that I'd just feel better if they'd use Gleam. Responsibility to guide, to nurture. It relieves aches, pains, chills, starts reducing fever fast, often within 30 minutes, so he can rest. To love, to protect. You know, Mom? All your little touches, that's what I miss. Well, that's what makes a home. A lot of nice little things all put together. If you're the head of a family, Nationwide Insurance can help with this responsibility right from the beginning with their Family Security Life Insurance Plans. They cover everyone in the whole family and cost less than you might think. Most of the coverage is on you. Some is on your spouse. And $1,000 on each of the little ones you have. Or may have. Nationwide invites you to compare their family security life insurance plans with any other. America, you've been loyal to our Betty Crocker desserts a long time now. Aww. To show our appreciation, we've come up with a little something special. The advertising industry has a little something for every member of the family. You shouldn't have. For the girl on the go, and that man in the know. There are role models for relating to other family members and product solutions to family difficulties. Children, will you behave? No headache is going to make me spoil their fun. Would you please stop that racket? Her headache's gone, and so's its tension. Anison, do they begin? Rushing relief power to your you headache. Like Anison relieves headache pain, and so it's tension fast. Touch somebody's feelings in a very special way. Let them know that you love them, and you're just a touch away. Touch somebody's feelings, touch somebody's day.
most of us are lonely sometimes. But we don't have to be. Join the Pepsi people. Honey, I first knew I loved you that day in the park. You remember helping that little kid, acting like kids ourselves? I felt I had it all together. And we should be together, too. Join the Pepsi people, feeling free. girls in love have such beautiful complexions maybe it's because they walk in the rain so much moisture helps make faces sweet and soft and that's the magic of noxema medicated skin cream with Avon, you never look so good when i finally colored my hair somebody said i looked great was i in love or something i think that's all that should happen hair color should make you look not obvious, just natural. To know you're the best you can be. The color is true, truly natural. Ivory won't make you into a beautiful woman, won't solve all your problems, make your boyfriend marry you or take you fishing, but it will help keep my skin healthy looking. You know, most private moments together, I don't feel like getting to know just deeply myself. The last thing you need is some actress saying something because she's being paid to say it. I'm Tina Louise, and for years you've seen me in some pretty sexy roles. But when the camera stops, I'm a woman just like you. It's incredible to me that I can be that close to someone. Sometimes it can make me feel awkward. I'm Barbara McNair, singer, actress, and Yes, they're paying me to do this commercial. But I'm also Barbara McNair woman, and I use Feminique every day. You don't have to ask for it. He knows what you want. Chanel. Does he have a favorite spot? Mark it with an X. Beyond intimacy lies fantasy. Ship and shore. Sensuous and sensible. Silky and subtle. Simple and super bite, lick, flowing, sensual, beautiful, ripe, sweet. There's mommy, pal. Sensual. Mark the spot with Xanadu. Did mommy wear with this dress? Sensible. Mark the spot. Beautiful. Wholesome. Mm -hmm. Does he have a favorite spot? Feel. Rip. Scent. Intoxicating. Vitamins. Nectar. Energy. Bursting. Vitality. Flowing. Food. Put the spot. Food for your soul. Let me tell you something, honey. Believe me, you're not getting older. You're getting better. The Vitality Dream. Products that promise youth, vibrancy, attractiveness. I'm sorry, honey. After all these years. But you don't have what it takes. You're too weak. You fade when you should be gaining. <laughs> You're just not my cup of tea anymore. There's a new you coming every day, every day. There's a new you coming every day. You There are maybe six million skiers in America. The Budweiser people understand that, too. They're making sure that caring isn't just a memory. And every taste of Beechwood Age Budweiser says so. And always will. You said it all, national ball. Vote. 
taste the way beer should taste. Refreshing and thirst quenching. It's everything a great beer should be. Wet, cold, and delicious. Wet, cold, Close friends and good times, very important. A kind of success, but there's something else. Tasteful material wealth. To be surrounded by those things which reflect achievement. I learned to sing with my mama in a church down Georgia way. She said, girl, you got a voice that could take you far someday. We laugh and talk about such dreams on our porch on summer night. I drink my RC Cola and see my name in light. Oh, oh, oh. me and my RC. Me and my RC. Wow. Don't you know I made it? Sang my way up to the top. I'm touring towns and sequin gowns and a concert never stops. But the best part of the show for me as I stand before the crowd to think about that back porch and sing a gospel hymn a lot. Oh, me and my heart, got to have it, me and my heart, but what's good enough for other folks ain't good enough for me and my heart. A Chrysler has always reflected a distinctive way of life. Today, there is this special edition Chrysler. Bowling vinyl Mercedes. And in the interior inspired Porsche. by the hues and textures of the desert. So, roll. Take it out and try it. All right, I'll drive it. But I'll say it again. All we really need is basic transportation. This is not basic transportation. Do we have to impress anybody? No. Do we really have to have a cutlass S? No. But I want it. I want it. And it's all yours. The world of I want it. In this world, the key to success is products. But the key to products, of course, is money. If all you need is money, come on into HFC. You can furnish an apartment. You can get a new TV. If you want a room addition, all I want is to go fishing. Whatever it is you wish, come on into HFC. My new A-frame, you like it? I came on in. Come on in to HFC. Today, we refreshed you on the beaches, on the crowded city streets, in homes, on farms, in restaurants from New York to Florida to Alaska to Iowa. You know Coca-Cola. It's the real thing. But when does an ice-cold bottle of Coke taste best to you? The evening when I'm sitting down. Yes, I've had a hard day at the office. <laughs> It's a day ending now, but still in a world that never existed. The six billion dollar dream world, created every day, and all for you. Good night. Um, so at the very least, there's some nostalgia there. Uh, some of you remember the commercials or at least some of the jingles. Um, 
I, I guess I, I suffered, I, I did a digitizing project where I digitized 10,000 TV commercials for a local university archive. And it, it changed my brain <laughs> in a <clears throat> wonderful, horrible way. First of all, I switched to Crest because I transferred 13 hours of Crest commercials. Um, I tried Grape Nuts again. They were horrible. Um, and uh, I very quickly became wary of uh, advertising, commercial advertising. I love it. You know, I can ad admire it. But it's there's some of these tropes that just keep coming out that are very difficult for me. Uh, especially advertising featuring children. It's children like playing like their children. It's just, oh, so horrible. Anyways, uh, uh, I had that film. I watched it many times, showed it many times, and then I did the, the 10,000 TV commercial digitization one year. And it, it just kind of, it's I'm not against TV ads, but there is a secondary message that TV ads um use to sell and that is that you're alone that you're not happy with yourself that you are insecure you have fears anxieties um and they're using it to sell brown sugar water like rc cola or you know pepsi or they're using it to sell things that don't really have anything to do with the fact that you are um anxious about your life and about dying. <laughs> and so that's the problem, I think. Um, those are very effective ads. Lots of money is spent on that. And even to this day, that is something that's still being used um, in advertising. Like really good ads tap into those different channels in your brain that are open. Um, all right, I'll get off the uh, um, soapbox and, and just say thank you so much. Um, even if you don't agree with what I have to say, I appreciate you watching and commenting. And um, I appreciate your eyeballs <laughs> for, for uh, uh, because I could just show these films and if there was nobody out there watching them, you know, it's it would feel a little bit more hollow and empty. And so I appreciate you guys uh, tuning in every day. Um, it gives me something to wake up for and it helps so soothe the anxiety is in my head. Um, if you like what you saw, there are certainly ways that you can help out AV Geeks. Uh, we just spent some money from uh, that we got from the uh, Patreon proceeds to get 60 films uh, shipped to us from a woman school teacher who no longer is teaching school and is downsizing. So that'll be exciting. That'll probably show up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe, whatever that means, um, because that's what people say. And then, of course, avgeeks.com is a place that you can go and see previous shows that we've done. Uh, we have done, this is, like I said, nine and a half weeks, uh, and we have done 280 films. Uh, thanks, Calvin, for that list that I've been adding to. Uh, but yeah, we've watched 280 films. Um, and I think that's a pretty accurate count. We might have missed one or two, but it's it's pretty good. Um, which means that probably by the end of the week, we will have watched 290. I don't know. Maybe we'll make it a challenge to get to 300. But um, again, thank you so much for tuning in. And um, I will see you again tomorrow for lunch. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.